Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa, where we take difficult biological concepts and make them easy to understand. In this video, we are going to be taking a closer look at the male reproductive system. We will discuss spermatogenesis, which is the process of sperm cell production. Then we will discuss the hormonal regulation that controls testicular function. Let's get started. Spermatogenesis, which is the process of sperm cell production, takes place inside the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Within each of the 200 to 300 lobules of the testes, there are one to three tightly coiled seminiferous tubules. These tubules contain specialized cells that will give rise to sperm. There are two types of cells that are found in the seminiferous tubules. The first one are spermatogonia, or spermatogonium for singular. These are diploid stem cells that develop from primordial germ cells. These cells will divide by mitosis and produce two types of cells, one that will remain a stem cell for future sperm production, and the other will be called a primary spermatocyte and will move forward in the process of spermatogenesis, which we will cover in more detail in a little bit. The other type of cell that are found within the seminiferous tubules of the testes are nurse cells, which are also known as sustentacular or Sertoli cells. These cells are tall columnar cells that extend from the basal membrane to the lumen of the tubules surrounding and supporting the developing sperm cells during spermatogenesis. Sertoli cells play a crucial role in spermatogenesis by providing structural and biochemical support. These cells are bound together by tight junctions, which creates a barrier that protects sperm from the immune system. This barrier is called the blood testes barrier, and it forces substances to first pass through the nurse cells before they can reach the developing sperm. This isolates the developing gametes from the blood, preventing an immune reaction from occurring. Now this happens because the immune system is going to recognize the surface antigens of the developing sperm as foreign since they did not begin to develop until puberty. And as the immune system was trained prior to puberty, the immune system was not taught to recognize them as self proteins. So there needs to be this barrier between the developing gametes and the immune system. Sertoli cells also nourish developing sperm cells and guide them through the different stages of maturation. Sertoli cells remove excess cytoplasm from the maturing sperm and eliminate defective sperm cells through phagocytosis. These cells also secrete inhibin, which regulates follicle-stimulating hormone levels through negative feedback to the pituitary gland, and they also secrete androgen binding protein, which binds testosterone and ensures that there are high levels of testosterone within the seminiferous tubules, which is essential for sperm development. Sertoli cells act like caretakers, which is why they're also called nurse cells. They make sure that spermatogenesis occurs in a controlled and efficient manner. Without them, the sperm cells would not be able to develop properly. Another type of cell that we find within the testes are lytic cells or interstitial cells. Unlike Sertoli cells, which are inside the tubules, lytic cells reside in between the seminiferous tubules or in that interstitial tissue. They are closely associated with blood vessels to be able to facilitate hormone transport. These cells synthesize and release testosterone a hormone that is essential for spermatogenesis, secondary male characteristics such as muscle growth, deep voice, and facial hair, and also libido. Now that we know about the different types of cells that are found in the testes and how they play a role in spermatogenesis, let's go back to those spermatogonia and how spermatogenesis actually occurs. Now remember, as I mentioned before, these spermatogonia are going to divide by mitosis and then they produce two different types of cells. 
one that is going to stay near the basement membrane and remain a stem cell for future sperm production, while the other, which will be called a primary spermatocyte, loses contact with the basement membrane and moves forward in the process of spermatogenesis. Primary spermatocytes, like spermatogonia, are diploid, which means they have 46 chromosomes. The primary spermatocyte will then replicate its DNA and undergo meiosis 1, which will reduce its chromosome number from 46 to 23, forming two secondary spermatocytes. As a reminder, during meiosis 1, homologous pairs of chromosomes will closely associate with one another, allowing crossing over to occur. They also line up um, at the metaphase plate, and then the meiotic spindle will pull one duplicated chromosome of each pair to an opposite pole of the dividing cell. Now these secondary spermatocytes are haploid with half the number of chromosomes, or 23. Then these secondary spermatocytes will undergo meiosis II without duplicating their DNA. During meiosis II, the chromosomes line up along the metaphase plate and the two chromatids of each chromosome will separate. This creates four haploid cells that are called spermatids. They are all haploid and they contain 23 chromosomes. Now, if you're still confused about meiosis because you've forgotten the steps from the past, you can take a look at my video on meiosis, which I will link in the description box below. The newly formed spermatids are round and non-motile. Before they can actually function as sperm, they must undergo a process called spermiogenesis. Spermiogenesis is the maturation of haploid spermatids into sperm. During this process, spermatids develop tails for motility, condense their nuclei, and form an acrosome, which is a cap-like structure containing enzymes that will help the sperm penetrate the egg. No cell division occurs during spermiogenesis. Once fully matured, they are now called spermatozoa or simply sperm cells. After spermiogenesis, the sperm release their connections to nurse cells in a process known as spermiation. These cells then enter into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule and fluid that is released from the nurse cells push the sperm along their way. At this point, the sperm are not yet able to swim. The newly formed sperm cells are transported to the epididymis, a coiled tube where they gain motility and further mature over about the next two weeks. From there, during ejaculation, sperm will travel through the vas deferens, mixed with fluid from the seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and bulbourethral glands, forming semen, and are expelled through the urethra, the same tube that is used for urine expulsion. This entire process is under tight hormonal control. At puberty, cells of the hypothalamus will increase their secretion and release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which signals the anterior pituitary gland to increase their secretion of two gonadotropins, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone stimulates the Leydig cells, those interstitial endocrine cells that are found between seminiferous tubules in the testes, to secrete testosterone. In the external genitals and prostate, testosterone is converted into another androgen, dihydrotestosterone, by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. Follicle-stimulating hormone and testosterone act synergistically on the nurse cells, those Sertoli cells in the seminiferous tubules, to stimulate the secretion of androgen binding protein into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. Androgen binding protein is important because it binds to testosterone, keeping its concentration high where spermatogenesis is ongoing. Once the degree of spermatogenesis required for male reproductive functions has been achieved, then the nurse cells will begin to release inhibin, a hormone which inhibits follicle-stimulating hormone secretion by the anterior pituitary. Both testosterone 
and dihydrotestosterone bind to the same androgen receptors found within the nuclei of target cells. This regulates gene expression, turning some on and others off. These androgens can then produce several effects. Before birth, testosterone stimulates male pattern development of the genital system ducts and the descent of the testes. At puberty, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone bring about the development and enlargement of the male sex organs and the development of masculine secondary sex characteristics, such as muscular and skeletal growth, facial and chest hair, and deepening of the voice. Androgens contribute to male sexual behavior and spermatogenesis and to sex drive in both males and females. Androgens are anabolic hormones. That means that they stimulate protein synthesis. This explains why males have heavier muscle and bone mass than females. A negative feedback system regulates testosterone production. When testosterone levels in the blood increase, it inhibits the release of gonadotrophin releasing hormone, and then this decreases the release of luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. With less luteinizing hormone release, there is less testosterone released by the lytic cells in the testes. This allows homeostasis of testosterone levels to remain stable. If testosterone levels in the blood fall too low, then gonadotrophin releasing hormone is again released by the hypothalamus, stimulating the release of luteinizing hormone, which in turn stimulates testosterone production by the lytic cells. Thank you for watching my video. I hope that this gives you a better understanding of what spermatogenesis is, how it occurs, and the hormonal control of spermatogenesis. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that you never miss out on new content.